warm uh, welcome to James Carson. Hello, so this presentation is storytelling, uh, what it means for your marketing, and most importantly, how to sell it, which I guess we're all here for. So I'm James Carson. I run a content strategy consultancy called Carson Content. It's been going about three months. I was previously uh, head of digital marketing at Bauer Media, Bauer, the largest privately owned publisher in Europe. So I work with brands like FHM, Grazia, and Heat, and building engaged audiences. Effectively, now I work with media brands, um, other brands, and e-commerce websites and offer agency support on content strategy. Uh, so you can tweet me at Mr. James Carson or check out my website, www.carsoncontent.com. So uh, I guess I'll we'll start this presentation by saying storytelling, marketing, is this a bit of a joke? Because when I, when I first saw it on social media, you know, storytelling is really relevant to marketing now. I thought this is just another kinchy buzzword. When I think of storytelling, I think of fairy tales and grim stories. But actually, I found that there were some parallels when I did a bit of digging, which you could use from stories in your marketing strategy. So I'm going to run through these films and uh, see what they have in common. So has anyone not seen two or more of these films? All right. Everyone's seen all of them, right? Yeah. Pretty much? OK. So uh, can anyone shout out what they've got in common? <laughs> They're all good, right? They're all blockbusters, of course. But I'm going to show you how they've all actually got exactly the same storyline, uh, which sounds fairly bonkers when you put The Lion King against uh, The Matrix, but uh, this is how it's done. So, a young and often naive individual whose life seems on a defined path. So there's Luke Skywalker, is a bored teenager on Tatooine. Uh, Neo, at the start of The Matrix, is a computer geek, uh, not really a hero. Jack Sully is a disabled marine. Uh, the other two, which are fairly anomalous, uh, anomalies in this, are Maximus and Simba, who are kind of in very powerful positions, but are nonetheless naive. So Maximus um, swears loyalty to the emperor in a way that gets him in trouble, uh, because that ends up with his wife and child being murdered. And Simba um, is a bit of an arrogant character who thinks he can do what he wants. So all of their lives seem on defined paths. Next. They all encounter something unexpected, all about the same way through the film. So it's probably about 25 to th a third way through. Uh, Luke Skywalker meets R2-D2 and C-3PO, who carry an encrypted message. Uh, Neo, or Thomas Anderson, comes across uh, Morpheus, who hands him the red or the blue pill. I can't remember which he takes. Uh, Jack Solid gets lost in the forest and ends up stuck in the forest. Uh, Simba's dad dies after he goes into one daring scrape too far. And Maximus um, Commodus tries to kill him, but he escapes. Next, that forces his life into the unknown. So Luke Skywalker meets Ben Kenobi, goes off his home planet. Uh, Neo wakes up in the real world. Jack Sully is forced into the forest. Simba meets Timon and Pumbaa outside of his kingdom. And Maximus is forced into Zuckerbar province, not Spain, where he wants to go back to. A mentor shows him the ways of this unknown. So Ben Kenobi shows Luke the ways of the Force. Uh, Neo meets Morpheus, who shows him Kung Fu. Uh, Jack Sully meets an alien I can't remember the name of, who shows him Baron Arrow. Um, Proximo is not really a mentor to, to Maximus, but um, nonetheless shows him, gives him advice on how to play the crowd in the Colosseum. And uh, Timon and Pumbaa uh, help Simba forget his uh, mistakes in a previous life and believe in Hakuna Matata. So there are a series of new challenges after this, normally which uh, involve heavy amounts of violence. Uh, Luke Skywalker uh, rescues the princess from uh, the Death Star, then later destroys the Death Star. Uh, Neo shoots up a lot of stuff. Um, <coughs> the humans pretty much destroy everything for about two hours in Avatar. Uh, Maximus goes through a series of violent fights. And Simba struggles really to come against his uh, old self. And this is finally revealed to him through, the, uh, through his son of childhood sweetheart, Nala, who leads him to the, uh, what is that animal? An orangutan? Rafiki, who shows him that his homeland has been destroyed and he must return. So, finally, they overcome a final boss and win. Actually, this isn't finally, but that's the Death Star. That's, uh, who's the Agent Smith? Uh, it's the evil colonel in Avatar. It's Scar, or it's Commodus in uh, Gladiator. 
And then there is some sort of absolution or rebirth. So in all cases, there is a birth or a death, apart from Star Wars, where Luke is just kind of accepted into the rebellion. So Neo actually dies and comes back to life. Jack Sully leaves his avatar self and goes into, uh, sorry, leaves being a human, becomes an avatar. And um, the circle of life is complete in The Lion King, and they have a child much like at the start. And Maximus avenges his uh, wife and child's death. So, they all have the same plot. Uh, a young and naive individual encounters something unexpected, forces his life into the unknown. A mentor shows him the ways of this unknown. There are a series of new challenges. The hero meets a final boss and wins, and he gains absolution and reward, or reward. And you can remix this as uh, one of 20, Pixar's 21 story rules. Um, it's worth looking up, but this is number four. Once upon a time, there was a mm, every day, mm, one day, because of that, because of that, until finally. So one of one <laughs> <laughs> sounds trivial, but once upon a time, you could put any, you could probably explain all the stories like this. Once upon a time, there was a bored teenager called Luke Skywalker. Every day, he tended to his rubbish crots because it was a desert world. One day, he stumbled across R2D2 and C3PO, um, who led him to Ben Kenobi. Because of that, he rescued Princess Leia from the Death Star. Because of that, he got the blueprints of the Death Star, destroyed it until finally, uh, yeah, he destroyed the Death Star. That's in slightly the wrong order, but uh, nonetheless, it does work. Um, so that's what these films have in common. They are all pretty much a classic storyline that um, has existed throughout the ages. And this isn't actually anything new. If we go beyond Hollywood and we look into things like Homer or medieval romance, you can see that The Lion King or Star Wars has actually borrowed very heavily from this. So these narratives transcend time. Um, this book on the left is called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which is pretty much about that, um, that all these narratives are pretty much the same, and there's thousands of them, and it actually transcends nations. So in Vladimir Propp's Morphology of the Folk Tale, he found that tribes that couldn't possibly have any relation to each other or have ever contacted each other in ancient times through to uh, medieval times actually had the same plot lines. So there was something about these plot lines that are classic, and people were generating them without actually talking to each other. So they're not actually copied in some ways. So it's actually called the monomyth, um, explained by this circle, call to adventure, supernatural aid, the hero leaves the known, goes into the unknown, um, there's a threshold and then a helper or a mentor, a series of challenges and temptations, an ab abyss or death and rebirth, and then some sort of absolution and return to his previous state. So, all right, Shakespeare, what does this have to do with marketing. Now, I think quite a lot, but anyone want to answer what these books have in common? So we've got, uh, just a show, show of hands if anyone's actually read them. Uh, Permission Marketing by Seth Godin. Okay, well, that's quite a popular one. Inbound Marketing by Dharma Shire and Brian Halligan. Uh, the End of Business as Usual by Brian Solis. Someone's read all of them. So have I. Oh yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> The Clue Train Manifesto by Assorted Authors. Okay, so what do they all have in common, apart from them being digital marketing books? Shorts. They're shorts. They all put forward the idea that advertising is in some way dead and that new media is here to replace that. And so we have content marketing um, has apparently replaced that, but I don't think content marketing is anything new. It's kind of remixed marketing. It's the hero with a thousand faces. But what's the problem with that? Well. Most people don't have a story like gladiators to tell. Their name is not Maximus Decimus Meridius. They're not commander of the armies to the north, etc. Uh, they're normally someone like this. Uh, their stock photo coming up from Google Images to sales rep. And their company is really boring. And that's often a problem that I've had asked of me. How do I do content marketing when my company is dull? Well, good question. But there's plenty of content out there that exists um, that is pretty dull fundamentally but yet has gone on massive runs and created a huge audience. So did anyone watch How It's Made previously, in a previous life? Yeah. Loads of people, yeah? It's just some sort of thing that would be on a, on a Saturday afternoon and you'd watch it to fill some time. But it's about factories making stuff. Uh, 260 episodes, 20 seasons, and 130 hours of how violins are made. So uh, <laughs> I don't know, if you find that entertaining, I think you can uh, work on your own marketing strategies to make things entertaining. But nonetheless, we're going to use the story of the monomyth 
in how to sell marketing software. So, um, I use a uh, dashboard called Leftronic in a previous life. Uh, you could use something like Gecko Boards, or it might be any sort of uh, software solution that helps you with data. This isn't really relevant uh, overall, it's just something I'm using as an example. But how can we sell that into a business, and how can we use the mono myth uh, to support our marketing strategy? So, we'll start with a persona. Jim is bored. He's a 28-year-old uh, marketer living in Leeds, working for an e-commerce mattress supplier. Sounds pretty boring, but we're trying to sell software to him. He's a company of 30, works in a team of three, and is middle in line. He feels he's too much spends too much time on reporting and not enough time on marketing. Sound familiar? Uh, I feel like I did that quite a lot. And then there's a lack of company understanding of data renders his reporting meaningless. So we're trying to get underneath his story. Um, and then he only has Excel to produce reports and has no formal training. Now, this information might sound made up, but the way to get to it, I guess, is to do traditional analysis like keyword analysis, um, also surveying or market, general market research to kind of build up these personas that will be useful when you kind of try and get your story, uh, your company involved with his story. So let's move on to persona behavior. Um, he uses Twitter sparingly. Uh, he's often on Facebook during work hours, three to five hours a week. Occasionally reads blogs, but doesn't subscribe any. So he's not like some digital marketing nerd. He's not one of us, I guess, that really wants to come here and really engage with digital marketing. He's just doing it as a job. Uh, likes football and going out on the weekends and unsure of work future and does not have big aspirations. So we built a picture of the customer that we want to reach and potentially get buy in there. So how do we solve a problem like Jim's? It's certainly not like this. Uh, we should set up a blog, a Twitter, and a Pinterest, and an Instagram. Um, that's probably not going to work, because as we've seen from the persona behavior, that he's uh, not on Twitter, he's on Facebook. So instead, we interrupt and act as mentor. So he's on Facebook a lot, so we can interrupt with an ad there. He might engage with that. He's also, we know from the market research, that he has to do a lot of unassisted Excel work. So he's more than likely going to search for Excel functions. There's no ads there for VLOOKUP. You might want to stick an ad there. You want to advertise tutorials and alternatives, survey his problems, and offer him rewards. So at this point, what we're doing is breaking him away from his known, which is Excel spreadsheets, and his company not really understanding the data, and taking him into an unknown of an internal, polit internal political battle, effectively, of how to get this software sold into his business. So once you get him to that point of uh, the kind of threshold, you've got to make sure you explain the solution for a sales call and then get him subscribed. So that might be through email or through you know, social media, particularly Facebook, because that's where he engages. And then he's got a series of challenges. So typical ones around this solution would be, this solution solves my problems, but I don't know if my bosses would buy into it. Uh, and it's just another tool. There's no real reason for anyone to look at it. I've been through both of these challenges, uh, trying to sell this tool into a business. But the best way to, do, to overcome these challenges is for the company trying to sell, uh, to deliver information about getting management buy-in for our solution and how to get everyone using our solution. So one of those might be how to get everyone using our solution. You could put installed TVs around the office, for instance, that show these dashboards and all this data. Um, and you might have a case study on that to provide. So you could help him through the business case um, and then he reaches the final boss and wins, which isn't Darth Vader, it's probably his CEO, or it might be his line manager, who will give him the money to then use this product. What will happen then? He's kind of in a, in a position of absolution. His uh, team are no longer getting meaningless data. They're saying, I understand these reports much better than, uh, sorry, these dashboards much better than boring reports, and I can get a snapshot of key metrics without asking anyone, which is great. So you're going from bored gym to uh, limitless gym. If you've seen the film Limitless, uh, Bradley Cooper certainly makes a good job of his career. Uh, so what's the ROI on that? <clears throat> well, I think this is really going back to a traditional sales funnel rather than thinking of tactical, um, you know, a a tactical things that would instantly drive acquisition. So we're going through a stage of awareness, consideration, conversion, loyalty, and advocacy. There's nothing new here, really. It's an investment return relationship. Normally, when you stick a load of money into marketing activity, it takes at least three stages to get to any financial impact. 
you have an action such as uh, we'll invest in building a Facebook presence. You'll have a reaction such as uh, the community might respond positively to that presence. And then you might have a non-financial impact such as that might deliver some more traffic to your website. That's not a financial impact. That only happens afterwards. So I would say when you're trying to sell uh, content strategy is it's not to sell tactics. Let's do some infographics. I find that a very difficult way to sell content marketing. And, and really the point is that this approach of you know, instant conversion doesn't happen very much. So this is a story about when I wanted to buy an iPad stylus. I recently got an iPad, used to draw a lot. So uh, I need a stylus, uh, not just my finger. So I don't go instantly, click on an ad on Amazon and instantly buy and woohoo, that's it. I might do. It doesn't happen all that often, particularly if you don't know anything about iPad styluses. So a story about what I did. I want an iPad stylus, but I know nothing about them. There's always too much choice online. I need to talk to someone. I went to the Apple store. They told me we don't sell them, but Selfridges do. And then I went to Selfridges. They were 30 quid. I thought they'll be cheaper online. Then there was too much choice. And finally, I came across an article on The Verge, which reviewed 20 different iPad styluses with video content and it finally made me select one. So people rarely behave like this. I want something, search, pound conversion. So I'd rather not sell that way. I'd rather much sell a vision from top of the funnel down to advocacy. So if we have a vision of awareness, 10% increase in ad spend to deliver 15% paid traffic increase, uh, that might be interrupting our board gym guy um, into finding out our product initially. And then a consideration phase where there's a 100% increase in organic website traffic in three months. So you've got the content there to rank on search engines. So related searches to that initial awareness will drive that. Then conversion, a 50% increase in basic subscription conversion. And then loyalty, 25 increase in advanced subscription. And then creation of a message advocacy program such as 30 brand ambassadors who will try and recruit other people within the community. So that's the vision. But then you need a strategy to, to make the vision happen. So Facebook and Google Ads set up a management. You might have a sales call. You might have a white paper, online chat, and articles in the consideration process. You could have a video. And then in the conversion process, a white paper, UX improvement, and supporting the sales process. Then loyalty, rewards for your renewal, and community management, which probably sits everywhere, but it's a major part of ag advocacy. So we're effectively going through the monomyth there by helping someone through a sales funnel and understanding their problems. You know, when we present them with a solution to their problem, we've got to act as a mentor to them and finally overcome a final boss. So this dog is thousands of years old. I think content marketing is as old as time memorial, really. If you offer some free stuff in a Roman bazaar, is that content marketing if people buy from you? So it's an old dog with some new tricks. Thank you all. Ask me anything.